of America, paved with the sins of our dark past, part of visualizing a new Kansas City means including the things some of us don't want to talk about, preserving the places that reverberate our stories, supporting the people we're so afraid of, and celebrating the depth of our diversity. The heart of America didn't have an attack after George Floyd was lynched. The heart of America was born with a heart murmur long before. But it's our task to not let that defect be the theme of our future. Tomorrow's Kansas City cannot repeat the racist behaviors of its past, casting a monstrous shadow on the here and now. You see, being intentional only goes as far as the room that hosts the conversation and goes nowhere when we focus too much on the place and too little on the people. Trust. The future demands that this be one Kansas City, requiring you to care about what's <laughs> over there. Back to the future. All right, everyone, welcome to session two, day two of Back to KC. Uh, I'm Brett Crawford, the Back to KC director. Uh, Kevin Coleman, my coworker, helped create that amazing, very powerful video uh, for the intro to this session. Amazing work, Kevin. Um, we are absolutely stoked to see that. Um, I am happy to have you all here. This stands to be a really important conversation that I've been looking forward to all week. Um, especially something as familiar as the event that we're excited to get to discuss with our wonderful panel here, as well as all of you in the audience. Um, I believe Mayor Q seems to be running a little late, but we're going to go ahead and get things uh, rolling in his absence. I'm going to welcome to the stage uh, Davin Gordon. Uh, what, I mean, Davin, his accolades are very, very long. And so I'm going to leave it to you to introduce yourself and introduce the rest of the panel, and I will step away. So Davin, I leave this panel in your capable hands. I'll see you soon. Thank you. I appreciate that, Brett. Shout out again to Kemet for putting that amazing video together. Um, I think it really highlights a lot of the, you know, opportunity and past that we've, you know, seen here in our city that we love and adhere so much. So much. Uh, just a little bit about myself, Davin Gordon, Senior Business Development Officer over at AltCap. Um, AllCap is a CDFI community development financial institution. I'll be asking Father Justin here uh, if, if he could share more about CDFIs. Um, but a, a lot of the work that we do at, at AllCap is really focused on providing access to capital to a lot of our, you know, under-resourced, undervalued, under um, leveraged, under um, capitalized communities. Um, and we know, which we'll talk a lot about today, um, that there's been a lot of intentional efforts in our past that have really created a lot of the, you know, disinvestment that we see in a lot of our communities. And it's my belief that, you know, we have to give everyone an opportunity to create uh, jobs and, and opportunities for themselves so that they can provide for their families, for their community. Uh, and if we're all able to participate in the, the vibrancy and the, you know, the, uh, the growth of our city, then we're all going to benefit from that. Um, so let's go ahead and get this exciting, um, much needed conversation going. We've got an amazing group of, of panelists here today. Uh, as some of these folks I definitely know very well, I I'm also excited to meet some of them uh, for the first time. So I'm gonna go ahead and let everyone go around and introduce themselves. Um, and you're gonna give a short, just quick you know, bio on yourself and then answer the question, what are you most excited about for Kansas City's future. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start off with someone I have not had the pleasure of meeting yet and hand it over to Rashida Phillips. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Rashida Phillips. I am the 
newish executive director of the American Jazz Museum. I say that because I've been here since January. Hard to believe it's been almost a year, uh, but with COVID-19 smack in the middle of it, boy, it's been quite a ride. Um, I'm excited to get this to this institution. It's been around since 1997 here in the 18th and Vine Jazz District of Kansas City. Uh, what really excites me about this particular community is that, you know, there's a lot of the anchor institutions, me along here at the Jazz Museum, along with uh, the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. We've got the Black Archives, we've got Mutual Musicians Foundations. It kind of has all of these center points of culture, of education, of entertainment. It's got everything, I think, in the mix to really make it a vibrant community. So what I'm excited about is it getting back not only back to its heyday, but forward to its heyday, right? Sometimes we look backwards and we expect that to have all of the answers, but we know that this time we're looking forward. So I'm really excited as a newbie here in town. I'm coming from uh, Chicago, Illinois. So you can imagine there's a lot there that was rumbling around in that city that I can kind of bring in terms of experience, but awareness of some of the issues that exist also here in Kansas City and also the opportunities, I think, to bring a lot of idea sharing and forward movement to the city. I should also say I am born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri, so I'm back to the show me state, <laughs> right? And it's time to show each other, I think, what we can make of this place. So I'm excited to be here in Kansas City. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, and welcome back to the show me state. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Miles Sandler with the Kaufman Foundation. Hello, everyone. Um, so yes, I'm joining you, Miles Sandler, from the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation, um, where I support really connecting um, our constituents and our audiences to the work that we do and learning from those groups so that we can improve um, the work that we do in our education space. Um, so proud to be here. You know, it's interesting. My roots are from Kansas City, though I never grew up here. I came and visited a lot, family. Um, and so coming back here, here three years ago to join the Kaufman team has been a uh, full circle and uh, being able to connect back with um, lots of family members. And within that full circle, when you say the future of Kansas City, what I think about is young people. Um, you know, I think that's always the easy answer, but what I think is phenomenal about the young people that I'm seeing come up right now is that they are so socially minded and so connected to creating solutions that not only are going to address a social issue, but also that have real kind of business bones too. So they're just like a whole new group of young people and they're really exciting to watch and connect with and talk to and learn from. <laughs> Amazing. I, I totally agree. And I think that's why, you know, I love the work that uh, Startland is doing um, when it comes to the education space. Um, let's keep the train moving. So I want to go ahead and hand it over to my uh, uh, wonderful friend, Deanna Munoz, um, to go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us what you're excited about for the future. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you so much for having me here. I'm very excited to be a part of this amazing panel. Uh, my name is Deanna Munoz. I am the CEO founder of Latino Arts Foundation. I am also the going to be the founder of the Chicano Art and Cultural Center um, that I'm working with the Porterhouse KC to become to open. Um, I'm also the um, newest entrepreneur um, owner of Midwest Chicana brand. Um, so I am a native of Kansas City, Missouri. Um, most of all of my 800 and some relatives live in Kansas City. <laughs> uh, we have a very strong entrepreneurial um, line here and I'm so um, excited to be a part of it now. Um, what makes me so excited is our Latino community. I just feel like um, we are on a roll of just banding together and working together and finding our space in Kansas City and really helping each other grow and um, be vibrant. And along with that, helping our young Latino community um, rise up and to know that they have people here that are mentors for them, um, advisors, friends that wanna see them you know, come up with us. So I'm just so excited for all that is to come in our Latino community because there's a lot happening in 2021. So thank you again for having me. Awesome, thank you, Deanna. And actually, I've, you know, I was very fortunate to grow up in the Latino community here in Kansas City and be a part of a lot of the rich, uh, you know, art and, and culture that we have 
uh, I did a lot of folkloric Mexican dancing growing up with your with some of your relatives actually. So um, awesome. So Father Justin, please take it away. Hey, it's awesome to be with everybody. Thank you. It's an honor to be on this panel. Uh, my name is Father Justin Matthews, and I serve as the Executive Director of Reconciliation Services, and we're a nonprofit social venture in Kansas City, uh, working to cultivate a community that is seeking racial and economic reconciliation to reveal the strength of all. And what I am most excited about um, is really two things, but they go together. Number one, I'm excited that in Kansas City, there is a very serious group of people that are working diligently to address uh, the racial and the economic inequities, not only from um, a systemic level, but at a heart level, at a personal level, but there is really good policy work that is starting to uh, take shape and to bear fruit. That policy work, you know, like when you listen to Kemet's song, you know, it's not just the room, it's not just the people. The one thing I would add to that is it's also not just the policy, but you've got to have the kind of the integration of people, place, and policy together to really make systemic change. And I think Kansas City's got the guts to do that, and I'm excited. Not that we don't have a big, huge uphill battle and lots of things to um, address, we do. But I'm encouraged by the number of organizations who are really working on that. And um, then I would say, secondly, I'm very excited that I think we are the most entrepreneurial city in the country. We haven't fully manifested everything that we're going to do yet. But along with that, I think that we're the most social entrepreneurial city in the country. And I think we're gonna be um, seen as leaders in the very near future, not only about issues of reconciliation and becoming a city of reconciliation, but also I think we're gonna be uh, seen as leaders in the, in the mid coast, um, having really looked at how we can create sustainable change by promoting small business, promoting business, but also promoting businesses that have a very deliberate uh, social entrepreneurial bent to them. And so I'm excited about that for Kansas City. It's a super cool time to be here. There's a lot of energy. And um, again, just really honored to be here in this amazing panel. Thank you. Thank you, Father Justin. And I completely agree with all your, your statements. Typically, a lot of folks would assume that you know, the Midwest, which is, is true in certain things, is always behind the curve on a lot of, you know, the movements that are going on. But I, you know, I think we can both attest to, you know, our daily our daily lives and what we do that we see that we're, we're starting to lead the way here in Kansas City with a lot of the social uh, enterprise work. And um, as, you, as you mentioned, a city of reconciliation. Uh, so lastly, we will go ahead and hand it over to probably one of the coolest mayors in the country. Um, I, I actually had the pleasure of running into him. It was a few weeks ago after a Chiefs game, just right. taking a, a stroll around the neighborhood. So, um, and I think that says a lot about your character and how accessible you like to be. So I'm gonna let, let you take it over. Hey, thank you so much. It is an honor to be with this panel, by the way. I see Deanna and Miles, Rashida and Father Justin, but all these folks that I've had the chance to get to know over time. And so uh, I look forward to that. Um, a few things that I want to say real quick. There's a lot that we can try to do at City Hall to support entrepreneurship. But but Davin, you know, this. like y'all do the work. You all are out there meeting the folks, meeting the folks who actually have real ideas. And for any of us who grew up um, knowing folks who, who, with ideas who didn't always have the banking and lending relationships, probably one of the toughest things is when you see somebody who is brilliant, but for whatever reason in society, we haven't made that connection. The way that we make a big difference in Kansas City, not just coming out of COVID, but for years ahead, and as y'all all know, there are these business panels all the time, the way you make the real difference is Right, building that bridge, building that bridge between the ideas, the financing, the support that you'll need for a startup, helping build those markets, and frankly, letting people who have succeeded, letting people who have failed, learning from all those stories and making it part of what we're all doing. And so that's that's why I'm in this. Um, that's why I'm very excited uh, to be a part of the panel. And I'm just lucky to have uh an organization like Alt Cap, and my favorite thing about when I bumped into him the other weekend, I'm like, you cool on the weekend. See, I have to, you ever get caught working out and you're in like the nerdy shorts and all of that, looking like you dress like the 80s or something, no offense to the 80s. But uh, whereas I was just like, man, he looks good on a Sunday afternoon. So look forward to the conversation and getting to be with more of the community today. 
Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so as you know, all of our audience knows, this conversation is you know, centered around back to the future. Um, and it's a lot about you know, these difficult conversations that uh, our country has been faced with, with a lot of the things we've had to overcome this year, um, specifically you know, thinking about George Floyd. And so um, just want to reiterate how important it is to understand our history so that we can really establish a better future for our families, for our, our, our children, our future generations. Um, so with all that being said, um, I, I wanted to, to touch on, you know, for me, I think Kansas City is well known for our barbecue and our jazz, right? And so I wanted to turn this question over to Rashida. Um, you know, I think yesterday there was some conversations about, um, you know, how big Kansas City is a jazz town, but um, how do we use the heart of Kansas City's cultural mecca to be a catalyst to rebuild our communities from your perspective? Well, certainly I think that Kansas City in many ways is missing in the narrative, at least from the jazz point of view. Uh, we just had a digital event yesterday that talked about uh, the importance of Kansas City's placement within that migration, right? A lot of folks think New York, a lot of folks think New Orleans, but sometimes forget that Kansas City was really at the center of a lot of that success and growth from jazz music and quite up you know, to the point to black music in general, even coming into the future play. So I think it's really important that we really stick our stake in the ground around the culture here, around all of the things that Kansas City, you know, in terms of jazz, in terms of barbecue, even baseball, my neighbor, Bob Kendrick would say baseball, Negro Leagues baseball too. You know, these are assets that really we can not only hang our hat on, but there's proof in the pudding, right? They've come along the way. They're not only rooted in the culture and the people here, but they are constant and they're really almost just as important. We've got Father Matthews here. You know, it, it becomes church for some folks, right? You, you have these, these anchors in our communities where people have fellowship, people have conversations, understanding, places of solace, places of healing. I think we're dealing with a large mental health issue beyond COVID-19. I think mental health is right up there at the top, what, what folks need to get through and, and kind of get, look forward towards out of this space of mental health issues. And I think culture actually helps with that. A lot of my work has been centered on arts and community wellness because they really go hand in hand, right? There's no separateness to them. It's not just entertainment, but it's really much more of a healing space as well. So jazz has always been that. It's also always sort of come out of these stories of hardship up to success. You see the points of of uh, struggle, but you see that folks come out in the end and with some beautiful ex expression and some ways to really create some magic out of opportunity. And Kansas City sits in not only in the heart of the country, but in the heart of that work. No, definitely. And um, I, I just wanted to open it up to anyone else. Did you, if anyone had wanted to include anything or any thoughts from what Rashida had to share, but uh, I, I'd be curious to hear, uh, Mayor Quentin Lucas, from your perspective, how is the city and how are you guys looking to, you know, leverage a lot of these assets that we have to continue to, you know, build and, and develop more economic development opportunities? Let me be real. Um, we need to do more. I don't see Rashida enough. And that's, that's on me. Um, that's, that's on us. We have this thing in Kansas City that we've had for a while of of having stuff and having resources and having people and then, then not engaging with them, right? Then not using them to help us leverage, I think, important things. I'll give a few examples. Um, a lot of music venues have reached out to me and said, Mayor Q, we need uh, money to get through the current pandemic. I understand it. Uh, why aren't we using, because I love what Rashida said about jazz and the basis and foundation of black music. Why aren't we using our cultural institutions to actually be a real gathering space there? It's more than just a place you go every few months for an event or for a tour when you have some a guest from out of town. It's instead looking to how you leverage it more fundamentally. And I guess maybe what I'll say is, while well, I throw shade on us at the city, it's a, it's a two-way street. And we all need to make sure that our relationships are about more than just money, right? It's about more than just, um, you know, kind of when you need something. It's instead being a part of, of understanding what that ecosystem is. That's why I like Father Justin uh, and, and getting lunch at his spot. 
right? Because it's just kind of like, all right, let me let me see what the work is actually in person. And that's what Kansas City needs to do, I think, a lot more of. We, we do a little bit too much of, which a lot of human beings do too, right? If they say, hey, what are you all about? You're like, well, I did this, that, and the other. I'm like, that, that's uninteresting, right? I don't, I don't necessarily need to know where Deanna went to school. What I want to know is kind of know, what are you about? Like, where's, where's the joy for you? Where's all of that? And I think that's what we need to try to extract from more of our institutions to really enhance what Kansas City sells. Because I'll stop in a second, sorry. Uh, because when I compare us to other cities, I, I actually, I compare every city I go to based on the culture. Like tall buildings are nice. And I'll look up at Chicago for a minute and be like, wow. But after that, I'm like, all right, where am I Where am I going to listen to music? Where am I going to grab a drink? Who am I going to talk to? That's that's what we need to do more for Kansas City. I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, the 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 culture and arts uh, only benefits our, our small businesses, right? Um, in so many different ways. Uh, you had mentioned Father Justin. And so I wanted to turn to you, Father Justin, to ask some questions more about some of the lasting impacts that a lot of our history around redlining and racial equity has had on our city. Um, can you share a little bit about your... Sure, and before I jump into history, you know, you mentioned George Floyd, we could talk about Breonna Taylor. One of the names I don't wanna forget because Rashida brought up mental health is, is Walter Wallace in Philly, because, you know, that's a man with bipolar who's, you know, shot dead in front of his kids. And if, if we're gonna be the kind of city that we claim to be, then we have to continually work on the issues at their root and really not just be uh, addressing the symptoms, but really get to the root. And one of the strong, strong roots is this issue around the failure of mental health systems and the interconnectedness, like the mayor was talking about, um, you know, between all of those systems. Um, so I think one of the things that people might not know if you just kind of breezed by Kansas City, you don't live here anymore, you grew up here. If you if you grew up in and around Kansas City, you heard the word Troost Avenue. You you knew that there was something about Troost. Some people grew up on the east side, some people grew up on the west side, some people, you know, grew up on both sides. My family was on both sides, depends on when you were there. And um, the issue is that every city in the United States has a Troost Avenue. There's a dividing line. That didn't just happen. That has to do with redlining and federal policy, local policy. It has to do with business as well and the way business was conducted by men like J.C. Nichols when he was the first president of the Real Estate uh, Association nationally and then exported racially restrictive covenants across the United States. You know, the, the history of the problems that we see that have to do with racial inequity as well as economic inequity in the United States that impact businesses um, and individuals actually have a pretty strong root here in Kansas City because of the history of redlining and racial segregation. And that's why I'm excited because we've not hidden from that as a city. We're not trying to sweep that under the rug, at least not anymore, and those who do get called on it because we as a city are not gonna be the city that we want to be that frankly I think we are in the future and today if we don't address that history of redlining and racial segregation. But the, the, the other thing that I would say is that Troost Avenue or whatever the name of the street is in, you know, whether you're at Over the Rhine or wherever, wherever it is in the United States that you're hailing from, Troost is not just a street in our city, but it's a dividing line that runs down all of our hearts. And each of us have something that live on the other, someone who lives on the other side of that street. And, and until we can really address that blight in our own heart, then um, we as individuals won't manifest what we know is possible. And again, though, for those that are listening outside of Kansas City, a lot of places aren't doing the hard heart work that Kansas City is doing. You've got city council folks who are proposing all sorts of wonderful initiatives who are making connections, for example, between, you know, the, the, the public health inequities and uh, racial discrimination and systemic racism. Those things don't get said in every city. Um, and so I'm very proud of Kansas City for beginning to acknowledge the history. And I think that, that really we've got this multi-step process and I'll end with this. And this is what we're doing. And I think this is business is a part of this too, by the way. Number one, cultivating a community that even cares. Cultivating a community that cares. Number two, 
with that community, acknowledging what actually happened. Number three, learning to extract what was precious, what strength was there from what was worthless. Because we could look all day long at the negative side of what happened in Kansas City during redlining and white flight. We need to. But at the same time, we also have to acknowledge the strength, the resiliency, the, the, the overcoming uh, amazing fortitude of our black and brown neighbors who endured racial segregation, who endured redlining. And when we focus on that, now we have something in common. We have a strength to build on as a city. And this is the last thing I'll say, that diversity and that work is a superior economic growth model for the region. And when we embrace that diversity and do that hard heart work, when companies come to Kansas City because they know that's what we're doing, all ships rise together economically, individually, and culturally. That's what I would share. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And, you know, I wholeheartedly agree with that. And uh, again, also excited about a lot of the intentional work that's happening. But, you know, unfortunately, I think there's still a lot of those lasting impacts and a lot of those barriers that, that a lot of entrepreneurs and small business owners and just people in general are still faced with today. So I wanted to turn this next question over to Deanna, um, because I know you've had, you know, your own sets of challenges to um, getting your foundation and your, your startup off the ground. Can you talk a little bit about what are some of the biggest hurdles that, you know, people like yourself and other people of color have, have uh, had to overcome for not only economic mobility, but, you know, just for opportunities. Yeah, and uh, thank you for asking that. And I love that Mayor uh, Quinton and Father Justin were so honest about uh, the realities of what is happening in Kansas City with our black and brown communities, because it's exactly what is happening. Um, I was on a Startland um, panel the other day, and it was about journalism. And I asked the panel, when is the last time you interviewed a Latino, Latinx uh, entrepreneur? And nobody could remember. And that's so... Um, shocking to me. It's not shocking that they weren't interviewed. It's shocking to the fact that they couldn't even name somebody. There are, I, I could name at least 60 entrepreneurs that are Latino in Kansas City that um, are not being recognized, are not being funded, are not even given a handshake. They, people don't even want to know their names. And um, I was that person 10 years ago. The only reason I'm here now is because I was on Queer Eye. And Queer Eye, and I tell this all the time, I'll be completely honest. It took somebody outside of Kansas City to see what I was doing, to see the impact that I could create in our community. And not only me, but that I was rising up so many other people with me. And we all needed this one opportunity to be able to, to be seen. Because what is so important about being seen is that the people that um, are young generation, if they don't see the people like them doing amazing work, then they think they can't do it either. I was that person. I didn't have access. I didn't have opportunity. I didn't have that when I was growing up. But there were so many people out here doing it, but I didn't know about any of them. And we're doing the same thing now and it's 2020. And why is that happening? Um, so I just, there. I, what, ha what, what do we do? I am, you know, I've asked for funding. I have zero to maybe very small amount of funding. Kansas City does not fund me. Um, most of my donations come from outside of Kansas City. And that's how we're still here. I've been here for almost two years in my foundation. We pay for everything. Everything is no cost to our mentors and to our mentees. And we pay our mentors. And how we're doing that is by funding from people from New York, funding from people from California, from Texas, from Oklahoma, because they're seeing such an impact happening within our foundation and the amazing work that's coming out of it, especially with our Latino Arts Festival that we did virtually for a whole month with over 60 attendees that was all donated by people outside of Kansas City, it's, it doesn't make any sense to me. And I think the biggest you know, heartache I have is the fact that there are so many more people like me. I'm not alone. And it's not even just the Latino community, it's all communities. There's people out there working so hard to ensure that our Kansas City community is vibrant and beautiful. And, do, and artists are staying and want to, and they want to help other artists, you know, but that's not going to continue if we don't help the people that are helping our, our community. Um, I've been lucky and very grateful for the people outside of Kansas City that are helping me because that's how I'm still here. Um, I'll also add this when it comes to mental health. I am so glad you brought that up because 
I lost my mother and father, um, my mother and brother from COVID-19, um, you know, just a couple weeks ago. And the Latino community is being hit hard by this. I don't know a day goes by that I don't know someone we lost or someone that's in the hospital, parents, grandparents, cousins, brothers, sisters, friends. Mental health is so important, but where do we have where a Latino community can come together, even virtually, to talk about it? You know, I'm here alone in my home, quarantined in, in the impact of losing my mom and my brother. But just seeing, you know, the, the wonderfulness we have on Facebook where I feel, feel that, you know, togetherness. But we need more than that. We need support from our community. We need support from Kansas City. We need support from people outside of the Latino community because we all are dealing with this crisis, but yet we're all segregated. And I feel like we're continually being segregated in all things when it comes to um, our communities. Yes, you know, I, you know. first off, I just wanna send my condolences out to you again and for you and your family and I think all of us really are sending you all the love and, and positive vibes. I know I've said it before, but, um, and thank you for being so vulnerable. And I think this really, you know, you, we're kind of taking a peek behind the curtain. You know, I think a lot of us see a lot of the beautiful and amazing things that are happening in our city, but these are the realities and the hard truths uh, of a lot of the existing uh, challenges that we're faced with, um, which I think makes you know, me gives me energy personally to keep fighting harder and harder every single day. Um, but you touched on the little ones. And so I want to turn over to Miles because I think Kansas City, you know, I, I don't know if a lot of folks realize this, but we're, we're kind of leading in, when it comes to a lot of the innovation and, and education space. So I was hoping you can maybe share a little bit about like, what are you excited about uh, when it comes to education? Uh, in our future, uh, you know, for Kansas City? What is that going to look like in, in 2030 in the education space? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, happy to answer that question. I, I do have to just real quick react to uh, what Deanna put on the table because I think it's really important. And it's it's honestly, it's a call out to, to funders, to philanthropy, um, to, you know, folks that have the wealth that they can contribute. Um, I think there's a, been a reckoning in philanthropy this year, um, and and I've seen some of that on a local local level. But I think there needs to be even more. But there's a recognition that we have to be investing directly into leaders of color. Um, we cannot any longer create these harbor masters, and there's been a lot of harbor masters that have been created. So large organizations that have the funding, um, that continue to get the dollars, and then those dollars eke out to smaller uh, nonprofits or organizations or art institutions or what have you. And so I think we have to, if we really want to celebrate the cultures and the people that have created our city, then we have to actually believe that they know what to do with the money. Um, they don't need handholding and, and they don't need to be patronized, but they can actually take the dollars directly and do more with it than someone that is not connected to the community and doesn't know the work that actually has to be done. Um, so I, I, I just thank you for sharing that, but just I think it is a moment where you know, philanthropy and foundations and funders have to shift. Um, and if they don't shift, I think they're clearly stating that they are not trying to create a solution for the problems that we are facing right now. So I just had to put that out there <laughs> before I answer the education question. Um, so I, I think this is probably, in my career at least, the most exciting moment that I have seen in education and specifically here in Kansas City. And I, I'll say that because I have never seen this level of momentum from, um, from leaders, from superintendents, from charter presidents, from uh, local nonprofits, from community folks. Like there is a level of just collaboration and momentum that I've, I've never been privy to. Um, and so the work that we've been really a part of is called the Real World Learning Initiative. Oh, 
Am I back? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so within that initiative, we have a goal by 2030 that all high school students, and what I think is important about this is that all students, so we are actually looking at the greater metro area. We're looking at rural districts. We're looking at our urban districts, our suburban districts. All students come out of high school with a um, graduation with also a market value asset. And why that's important is because we recognize that Young people, and there's an assumption that sometimes, you know, more affluent neighborhoods are getting this. And to some degree, they may be getting a little bit more. But overarchingly, our young people are just not getting the real world learning, the relevant skills that they need to be successful in the future. And so this has been an extremely um, dynamic shift. And I've really seen superintendents take on this work in a way that, again, I've just never seen, uh, really from top to bottom, placing this work in their strategic plans, uh, collaborating monthly, coming together with other superintendents monthly and sometimes more than monthly to figure out how they can um, keep elevating this work and keep improving. So that's, I think, really exciting. The other piece that I am seeing a lot is around the workforce space um, that I think is really dynamic and different. Now, obviously, we're in a, a really challenging time. Uh, many people are out of work um, or they are really trying to figure out what do they do next. And what I'm at least hearing in the conversation in workforce development that I don't think we've heard before is not only do we need to make sure that people don't just get into a job, but they get into a job that actually has a ladder somewhere um, that has the training and the, and the process that can be accessible. But the other piece I'm hearing a lot more is how do we embed the skill sets that are necessary within those training programs. So for example, how do we actually put entrepreneurial mindset within our training programs so that even if it's a technical job, um, we are actually equipping people with the level of decision making and critical thinking and problem solving that's actually necessary for them to continue to elevate themselves within whatever career that they're going into. So. I do think it's a really fascinating time, an exciting moment, and I've seen more collaboration um, than I have ever seen, but we also have a lot of work to do. <laughs> so we're gonna have to just keep pushing and pushing and pushing on that system change. Awesome, thank you. I, and I'm a huge believer in the design thinking and, and real world learning. Uh, I think that's probably why I was, you know, open to uh, taking the seat on the board for Startland, uh, is because I had a firsthand uh, opportunity to witness the power that design thinking and real world learning can have on our youth, and they do it in a one day, like two, three hour project, and these kids just like their their eyes light up, and they they thought entrepreneurship and all of that was just like high tech, and then they don't realize that you can implement that skill set into their everyday life um, and just seeing you know how excited they were about that was just so cool and, and i really appreciate your comments about the funding um, i i actually read uh, decolonize wealth earlier this year um, and that really opened my eyes to you know realizing how much of that colonialism mindset has infiltrated all of our systems and and uh, structures within our country and you know, I think we all have a role to play, not just the foundations, but all of our large co corporations, our anchor institutions, we all have a role to play. We all have opportunities to find collaborations and partnerships. And luckily here in Kansas City, I think a lot of us are really trying to, to do what we can, um, but to Deanna's point, there's so much more work to be done, right? Um, and I, I think one, la one last thing, and I just wanted to open it up to more of reactions or if folks you know, had anything that was, uh, that came up during any other comments is, you know, unfortunately, I think the show me state mentality is really, you know, hurt our our city, our state, and our city. Uh, that mentality that we need to see it first before we believe it, I think, is really, you know, I, I think it's really baked into our culture uh, as Missourians, um, and I think we've got to move away from that. And I'm curious to hear what. The mayor thinks about that, but I think that's the problem with a lot of folks and opportunities is they're like, well, I, I don't, I don't see you doing this yet, so why should I believe you or tell you? So, 
Well, you know, you want to go on a big, uh, to open up a, another can of worms, let's talk about policing as the best example of that. Defund, reallocate, whatever you're saying. The interesting thing, and I think in many ways the biggest political challenge, is that you're right. People don't know what it looks like, so they say, why do it? Um, you know, time span, real fancy. I don't know why, how I got on. But um, a nice, uh, there's a woman from Oakland who was saying that it isn't so much a question, the, the reason the polls say people don't really like defunding is because they're like, yes, we want some resource to respond to negative situations. But they're not saying we want just the exact same one. But if you tell people, yeah, we're just going to take away the only thing that you know when something comes up, then they'll be like, oh, well, you know, don't do that. I mean, what we need to do in more of, of our areas is have this suspension of the old line rules, the way things are always done. Let me tell you something, and I guess I'm just more real on Fridays. A bunch of stuff we're doing isn't working. We've been doing roads the same way for decades. They're not good, right? We've been doing our housing department the same way. No offense to the people there for decades. It ain't working, right? And so, it, it, and again, not that, not that there aren't some wins, not that there aren't some people who are out there working hard right now, but we need to see, and I even need to take this sometimes, is that they're not saying you are individual home and, you know, go, go cry all day, but instead it is, hey, how can you do better? You know, back to the police, probably the biggest challenge I have sometimes with them is that I have tried to tell their leadership whenever they'll listen, um, look, it ain't, it ain't even about you. It's about how the department can do better, right? So don't be like, well, how dare they back the blue and I'm just gonna have this like distance from the actual We can do our job better. That you know, I'm gonna be quite honest. When Deanna just talked about her family, I think things because a I haven't listened to enough of the Latino community all the time through this. I listen to doctors, I listen to scientists, I know the data, but I don't humanize it. So then, who's in my ear all the time? All the all the haters who don't like masks and are saying you're destroying businesses and all that sort of stuff. So we end up making policy that's about how we keep them open as opposed to how we keep people alive. That's, that's bad. Now, I think what real leaders do in your businesses or in any organizations is you recognize that. So instead of me being defensive, if Deanna were to say that, is to say instead, well, how can I do better to make sure more people don't go through that very thing? That's why she shares it. And I think that's what we need to do with more of our organizations and institutions, a critique doesn't mean you're useless. It means that you can do better. And I think all of us need to recognize this. And Kansas City needs to be a lot bolder with recognizing that looking at our warts doesn't mean we're bad people. It means that really folks want us to excel to the level we can. Yeah, I think that Kansas City nice has been a, you know, a, you know kind of a detriment to our growth. Um, everyone wants to be nice. No one wants to step on any toes or or be brutally honest, but I think that's the only way we're gonna be able to move forward. Um, and so, you know, I was kind of curious, you know, Rashida, you coming from Chicago, which is a little bit more, I would say probably a little bit more progressive than Kansas City. You know, you mentioned you, you've learned some things coming from Chicago. Do you mind, you know, sharing a little bit about some of the things that you learned there that you would hope to, to bring here with you? Absolutely, I think more collaboration is key. Um, they figured out a few years ago that folks needed to partner more to share resources, right? So funders began shifting to finding more of the community embedded organizations. And that sometimes they would partner them with the larger institutions, not because there was a part, you know, a parenting aspect to it, but because there were some resources that existed at the large institutions that would also help aid the process of funding, right? And there would be a natural sort of organic partnership that would rise, rise a lot of folks up who are in the neighborhoods. You know, Chicago is a city of neighborhoods, extremely uh, segregated. Absolutely, you know, racist policies there, particularly on the, the south and west sides, much like here, Roosevelt is the dividing line there. And so you have a lot of imbalance in terms of those communities. But you also have a lot of folks who are 
working together and you have a youth activism base that is unlike any other. I mean, I think that, you know, as you were mentioning young people and the excitement around young people and them sort of having an understanding of business sensibility, of education, of ways to make things better, Chicago was just turning that out. I mean, the young people were really turning over policy. They were pushing out leaders. They were up in the faces of politicians who were not doing their job properly. And, and you knew it, right? They would be on the front page. So certainly there was some sensibility. I think a lot of the young people really stepping up front and center to do the work. But you know, that's not an easy city too. I think we have opportunity here being a smaller city that we could maybe get beyond a lot of the bureaucracy. Uh, most people know Chicago as the windy city, but that was because of the politicians, not just the cold wind that's blowing all year long. Uh, so we can get beyond, I think, a lot of that red tape and things that we have to go through processing over and over here in Kansas City, ideally, but we've got to work together much more. You know, I think in this space of scarcity and COVID has really kind of ramped up the, the scarcity feeling and a lot of the, the commu communities that are under-resourced, unfortunately. You know, here in 18th and Vine, for instance, we had a very active summer with a lot of smaller uh, organizations or smaller uh, folks who are getting together and just creating street parties or creating initiatives or creating things here and there. And it became a traffic jam, quite honest, honestly, because you're dealing with scarcity in your thoughts and you're thinking of survival, right? I've got to survive. I've got to make something happen. I can't look towards this person to give me the resource or the money, or I can't look towards this person to give me the food. So I'm going to grab some friends and I'm going to make it happen. And I think a lot of that survivalist mentality is, is natural, right? We come from a country with policies. We come from a, a slave mentality in a lot of spaces where you got to get your friends and you got to get out, right? And you do that by any means possible. Uh, so some of that is just embedded into, I think, our culture into sort of American society. But what I'm hoping for Kansas City is that can step up a little bit more, quite honestly. I hadn't been here in 25 years. And granted, I was from the eastern side of the state in St. Louis. But when I came, there was virtually nothing that was happening here. I kept thinking, and people kept looking at me as if I was from a big town in St. Louis, and I couldn't believe it. So when I got back here, I was pleasantly surprised. But, you know, I was on the driving tour, you know, thinking about the job, thinking about the community. And on my driving tour, the first stop was Troost. Person who took me on the driving tour dro drove me right down Troost, explained everything to me, black and white. This is this, this is that, this is the way it's played out. These are the politics. This is what you have to look out for. You know, I'm newbie to the city. That's my first reality check. That's my first reaction. I think the beauty of not being here and the same thing we're not being from Chicago is that I lived all over that city. I moved often because I wanted to get into neighborhoods and all spaces because I did not want to be limited to the past. And I did not want to be limited to, you know, me being me being a person of color, being, being, being a black woman and having to live in this neighborhood because my people could only afford to live here. I made a way in every neighborhood. And so I look, I've already lived in two places here since I've gotten here in a year. I've already lived east of Truce and West the truth. So I'm really looking forward to bridging a lot more of those initiatives and working with partners here and really growing with each other because that's the only way we're going to make it work. That's the only way we survive is working with each other much more. Yep. I, you said it perfectly. So I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, we're coming close to uh, the hour on our program. So I wanted to go ahead and take some time to acknowledge some of the questions that people are dropping in. Uh, this is a great question for anyone that um, that wants to answer it. Besides the Kansas City Chiefs, our, our wonderful barbecue and the amazing jazz, um, is there anything else culturally that we want Kansas City to be known for uh, in 2030? Uh, and, and I'll go ahead and say for myself, I, I think uh, Father Justin alluded to the social enterprise hub or entrepreneur hub. And I think that's something that I would love to see, you know, in 2030 is Kansas City being known for that uh, place that social entrepreneurs want to, to come and, and grow their businesses. Yeah, I'll just tack on real quick. I totally agree with you because whether you're Deanna and you're putting forward art in, in the Latinx community or whether you're Rashida and you're doing work, to build on the Jazz Foundation and the Black Music Foundation here, or your Miles, and, and you're, you're involved in philanthropy and education, all of that requires entrepreneurial thinking. And that's what you see on this panel. The mayor is bringing that forward in some of the policies. Somebody asked a question about, are we using um, federal funding to unwind systemic racist housing practices? Well, first of all, I can tell you the county and the city, in, in this case, in my organization, the county has put money towards 
um, helping us to keep people housed. And that money is coming from federal and state sources. I know the city is working on policies, healthy home policy and other things that have been advanced um, with Casey Tenants and other groups in order to try to um, direct funding towards keeping people housed so that we can unwind the history of systemic racism within housing within our city. That takes entrepreneurial thought. And I know there's this kind of blend in this in this panel, like we're talking about it acknowledging really hard things. But I, what I don't want to miss in the midst of that is that these people that were that I'm surrounded by here, they're all entrepreneurs, from the arts to politics to to the foundation work. You know, this is a city of entrepreneurs who are trying to use that entrepreneurial spirit to advance our values, and the city is better for it. I didn't have that feeling when I grew up here. There were big businesses in an empty downtown. I don't see that anymore. And I promise you the vacuum that COVID has created with regard to some of our awesome restaurants, our awesome bars, like stuff, I, I wear a collar, but I still go to some of those places too. In fact, Mayor and I may have had a drink once in a while. I don't know. But like, that vacuum that's being created by COVID, I give you 12 months, there's going to be such cool stuff in Kansas City. Because we're a city of entrepreneurs, that's something that is part of our culture. And anybody thinking about it ought to move here and be a part of it. Because like the energy's here, the energy's here, and we're willing to address the hard topics at the same time. And when you combine that entrepreneurial spirit, the resources, the policy, and the people, and the creativity of those individuals, there's nothing that's going to stop us. And if it gets in our way, there's a bunch of young folk coming that are going to knock it down anyway. That's, so right. We're, we're coming. that's right. That's the only thing I would just add on is I just, you know, I want us to be known for the level of a systemic change we've had in education, that we are not only um, supporting our young people to be the brilliant folks that they are, but that we've created the conditions that they can really shine and they can take their position in our city and they can create a business or start an initiative or join a company and change it from the inside out. Because I think that they're highly capable of it, but we have to celebrate them. We have to support them. We have to create a system that is ready to be able to allow them to do what they are meant to do. And if I can add to that, um, I am a, well, when I started this, uh, it's in my 30s and I'm now I'm 45 and I had no entrepreneurial experience. I've never worked for a not-for-profit. I've never been on a board and don't even know what a board consisted of. But the people in Kansas City are the ones who got me to the space that I'm in right now. Most importantly, the Latino um, leaders um, in the black community. Um, I'm going to give a huge shout out to Porterhouse KC. I was the only Latino entrepreneur in their first cohort, the only one. And not only that, but they invited me to open up the Chicano Art and Cultural Center, which is Chicano Latino based in the black community, because that's the only way we're going to build our bridges. That's the only way that we're going to unite and desegregate is to start opening up our doors and our opportunities and access because I have access now. Everyone reminds me that. I have access and it's my turn to start giving that access back to everybody. And that's all I've been doing since I gained this and knew how to work it. But their ability to say, you're not black, you didn't grow up in this community, but you know what? You have the spirit that we all have. You have the passion, you have the drive, you wanna make your community better. And not only that, you wanna help our community and we wanna help your community. So let's do this. So a huge shout out to Don, um, Dan Smith and uh, Sharon Thompson for doing that because they taught me entrepreneurial spirit. They taught me the entrepreneurial practices through their program. And I hope more Latinos get that opportunity because we don't have that kind of opportunity within our own community in Kansas City. We have nothing like that. Yes, we have entrepreneurial programs that you can be a part of, but nothing is like the feeling of being together with other people who look like you, who grew up like you, who know what it's like to be a minority in Kansas City, um, who knows what it's like to be a black and brown business. That right there is priceless. And I just thank them for giving me the opportunity. So yes, if we do not give these people funding, if we do not rise them up, people like me, I'll be the last one. I'm not going to be the last one. I'm going to be the first, but damn it, I will not be the last one out of that cohort.
anyone else have any any thoughts to share? I see another question. Is there a directory for finding minority entrepreneurs and funders, founders here in Kansas City? Uh, I believe there are a few directories, um, specifically probably more around uh, retail and, and restaurants and stuff like the hospitality. Um, I'm not sure if there's a comprehensive list, um, but I definitely will, will follow up with the team at Back to Casey and Startland about um, getting some information out to you. Um, Darcy Howe also mentioned innovation entrepreneurship. Uh, it's it's a great place to to build a business, whether you grow up here or not in Kansas City. Uh, and I would share, you know, as far as, you know, the cost of living, uh, we are competitive versus any city in this in this country. Um, and we also have Patrick Mahomes as our quarterback for the next eight years. So <laughs> I think he by himself will create a lot of opportunity just for other people. Um, and with that, Brett, I'll let you go ahead and close yeah. this out. I really, I was sitting here kind of wondering if I could just let this go for another hour and if anyone would notice because I'm having such a great time listening to all of you speak and, and hearing all the terrific perspectives. Um, Davin, first off, thank you so much for moderating this. Um, thank you to all of our panelists for tuning in. This has been a real delight. Uh, we have recorded this session for anyone that has tuned in late or had to leave early. Um, we're hoping to have all this up on the Startland YouTube channel next week uh, so you can review it and share it out uh, as well. And uh, with that, we also have breakout sessions uh, available to anyone who's in attendance as well as our speakers if you'd like to stick around if you're able to talk more one-on-one -on -one with some folks in the audience and answer more questions. Uh, I'll go over with each of you after I pause the session uh, to explain to you how to do that. Um, there's a button at the top that says go to lounge so everyone can meet in the lounge if they're able. Uh, real quick, Father Justin, Davin, Deanna, Mayor Q, Rashida, and Miles, again, thank you so much on behalf of myself, Back to KC and Startland for being a part of this panel. Uh, super eye-opening for me, someone who moved from Chicago to Kansas City in June of this year. Rashida, I'm sure you and I have a lot of stories we can swap about that. Um, but thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you to our attendees. And if you're able to join a breakout room, I will see you there. Thank you guys so much. Mm -hmm.